send the holding page live. Just announce that the stream is up, just with the holding page. Okay. So I imagine you were still because maybe you're looking at that and just seeing that go up. That's the language. I would let them know. I am Steve, one of the speakers. Um, just checking how we're controlling slides. And um, there's a flicker on the table. Yeah. It's got a drop in on the side. Okay. Is there a monitor that I, so I can see the images without having to look behind uh, no, me? No, there isn't. That's a shame. Okay. Um, right. Is it possible? Not really.
Yeah, thanks. Sitting, yeah. With our back to the screen? Yeah. No, it's not. I'm just saying I'm not sure how to stand, but it's not that easy. It's difficult to read that kind of read from that to See what's coming up next. I said, we haven't got a monitor, so... Yes. Yeah. Trust yeah. that everything comes up in the right order. Yeah. Could you please find out as much as possible? We're expecting to have quite a full house, and we just want to make sure those rooms are stuck as well. Intimate space, this one. It's good, isn't it? I like it. We're actually working with you at, um, in Cumbria, in Windermere, oh. at the moment, at um, Felford. Yes. The new, the new cafe. Yeah, the boathouse regularly gets flooded. Exactly. <laughs> so I've been, but it is uh, a boat house. been working with Harvey. Okay, I don't know Harvey. Harvey Wilkinson, who's yeah. the head of design okay. at uh, Cumbria, yeah. the National Park right. area. Yeah. I mean, it's slow burn, let's yes. say. Yes. <laughs> Slowly, slowly catching monkey long term views. I think so. Yeah. I've got to yeah, I am. Oh, yeah. It's just oh, yeah. It's oh, yeah. yeah. It's one of our yeah, that's fun. fishing guests. That's my last slide. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's fun. So, what's it look like looking like? Um, the course I recall from the It looks like we can't afford to do what we were thinking of doing. Right. So, <laughs> where was the money coming from? Not just any too big for this place. We, no. we did think we were going to. We did talk about movies. Not grants. But there's a show. Mostly in terms of money. But I think post, post flood. And we're expecting to be the same. Yeah. Yeah. But it is a fairly routine activity for the Lake District these days. Tell me about it. Yeah. Mm. I have a, a small place up in Hartsup, which is up in the North East Corner. Mm. So we, we very close to Glen Reading, so we moved through the whole place mm. last year. Mm. We're very involved in the Yeah. It's been a Yeah. 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 I'm not sure your mic's working.
um, our points quite out just through the staircase that we came in at, and um, through some other point is the low square. Um, toilets, there's one set of toilets just outside here, and the second set of toilets um, in the foyer where you had coffee and tea earlier. Um, we will be live streaming today's proceedings, um, so anything you say, any questions you ask will be on camera, but hopefully that's not going to stop us from having some live, lively debate. Um, our Twitter hashtag for today is hashtag Optimism, so if you want to join in the debate online as well, please feel free to do so. Um, so the reason we're gathered here today is that last year Julie's Bicycle published a guide on Fit for the Future, Invest in Environmentally Sustainable Buildings, and largely in response uh, to growing demand from the community. And as you can see, we've pretty much got a full house today, so this is a hot topic. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Um, thank you to the Arts Council for supporting the event, um, the serendipitously named Fit for the Future Network for helping us program some of the sessions, Good Energy, who are sponsoring the drinks later on, and of course the Lurk Hammersmith, who have graciously agreed to host all of us for today. So to kick off proceedings, um, please let me introduce Sean Alexander, Executive Director of the Lurk, <laughs> and uh, Julie's Boston Board Member. Thank you. Everything, it was a conference 
still be sun and everything from the use of natural daylight to sources of light in as many rooms as possible, passive ventilation, there's um, air source, heat pump, fueled ventilation and air handling in our main auditorium. You'll find um, a cedar roof uh, up at the top of the building and LED lights throughout with efficient controls. Um, really everything that we could possibly do, uh, we did in terms of trying to make the building as green as possible. And that's quite tricky to do when you combine an existing building with a brand new building. And um, I'm delighted to say that we've just submitted our final REAM assessment and we are on track to get an excellent rating for the building, which is quite exceptional, I think. Um, I'm also delighted that alongside a lot of the things that are built into the building to keep it as low energy as possible, there are also things that positively contribute to the environment. So I've mentioned the green roof. We also have our lovely roof terrace outside, which is one of the few green areas in Hansen. And my proof for how brilliant that is, is the lyric duck, who nested on our roof terrace and produced her first batch of ducklings in the week that the building opened. And uh, they were loved and cared for by the staff. They were really fond. They took them down to the river. They were the And uh, she loved it so much. She came back again this year. So we had another six or seven ducklings on the roof terrace. And we expect she's going to be on more regular repeat attendance. The other thing uh, that's really important, I think, about green, and we all know this, is it's not just what you build into your systems that help you into your buildings that help you to be green. It's also about how you then run them, how you operate them, your systems, your people, your behaviour. And again, that's something the lyrics have been very actively engaged in for seven years now, monitoring our energy use, with understanding it, and trying to drive down emissions. And we have um, been helped in that massively by Judy's Bicycle. We've been um, following their industry green programme <coughs> certification. The lyrics one of the first, was the first any actually, to achieve a three star rating, which was the highest you could get at the time, and it maintained that uh, for four years. And while we've been doing our assessment this year, the range of activities that we get up to in any one year are incredibly extensive, and they run from brilliant staff engagement campaigns around well-being or COP21, <coughs> giving up single-use plastic for Lent or green travel, to more kind of nitty-gritty things like analysing our, our energy data and realising that we needed to turn our in or sign off during daylight hours because the amount of energy it was using. And recycling 97% of our waste and working with our catering contractors to make sure that the events that we do in the building um, are run in as green way as they possibly can. So it's incredibly expensive, extensive, <laughs> and I'm, I'm really delighted actually to be able to announce today that this year under the new scheme, the Creative Green Scheme, the Lyric has achieved a four star rating, which we are incredibly proud of, thank you very much to Julius Pascal. And uh, that, as part of that we received um, a maximum score for our commitment. And uh, obviously it's difficult when you've extended your building 64% to drive down your absolute energy emissions. But our relative energy emissions are 73% down on last year. And our absolute emissions are actually down 5% on our baseline year in 2009, despite that massive expansion and despite having 200,000 people through the building last year. So um, we're really delighted with that achievement. But more than that, Creative Green provides us with the framework that we use for improvement. And we're on a mission now to achieve five <coughs> next year. That's the plan. So at lunchtime, um, I would love it if you would like to join some of my team. My green team are going to be part of the um, marketplace in the Ruby Foundation in Foyer. They would love to tell you about the things that they do, and they would love to show you around the building um, because they are rightly very proud of it uh, and all that they've achieved here. I wanted to say just finally why, I suppose, why this is so important to us at the Lyric. And I suppose there are two main reasons. The first is, as a charity, as many of you in the room are, it's absolutely um, beholden on us to use our resources as effectively as we can. So finding those efficiencies, driving down costs, means that we're using the money that we, uh, it's hard earned as well as we can, and making sure that we're prioritising it in our programmes, be they on stage or off stage, our work with young people. And secondly, 
Because we are a leading cultural icon in this part of London, we consider it's absolutely our responsibility to model best practice as far as we're able to, to help show the way towards a low-carbon future and to inspire those who are around us. So that's why we do it. So I know we're not alone in that. And I know that on the panel here and in the room, there are many inspiring stories of people who have taken their cultural buildings and are working to green or have, have successfully greened them. And there are others in the room who are at the start of their journeys. So I'm really looking forward to the inspiring case studies and ideas and debates and discussions about what's easy and what's not today. And I hope that we all leave uh, inspired and equipped to go and green our cultural estate. Thank you. Ideas and solutions to this problem. 
You'll find some ideas in our biofic for the future, our very happily named uh, uh, partners fit for the future. Pete speakers from the National Trust, and, and of course all of you. Um, I hope that we'll find a lot more today than the stuff that we think we already know. And we're not primarily focusing on any single one of the problem. Uh, we'll look at green space, community energy financing and energy management, all of which work really well together and when they are suffused with purpose. And at that point you start to get really exciting transformational solutions. Another idea, which Jake is doing an awful lot of both in the UK and internationally, which we don't touch on much today, so I thought it was worth just mentioning now, is policy. Um, and I want to just touch on a really great example of light touch policy which has really worked. For those of you who don't know, in 2012, Arts Council England made environmental reporting and the development of policies a funding requirement. It wasn't just the London Olympians who deserved a gold medal, because this has been quite an exceptional intervention. That reporting has been accompanied by resources and events which JB has been delivering, which, of which this is one. So there's something really important here. Simply by asking organisations very diverse, very complex, all over the country, of all shapes and sizes and activity types, Simply by asking organisations to account for their environmental impact. ACE, with us closely accompanying them, have prompted the conditions for creative, practical, operational and financial change, with minimal investment from them. Artists are taking a lead from these two, and this means audiences are really beginning to feel those changes. And I think what Charles has described at the lyric is a very good example. It takes time, but thoughtful policy can be a really big and a really good solution to a super wicked problem. I'm sure we've all encountered the same difficulties and constraints, both within our work and, our, and, and, and other parts of our lives. Stuck habits, tussles over spending priorities, knowledge lost over time, short-term thinking, and a perception that, that sustainability is complex, it's confined, it's boring, it's counter to creative freedom and it's not interesting to the public. But this is really rapidly changing and it's gaining speed incrementally, especially since COP21. That 20th century mindset has converted into a 21st century mindset. JB is working with hundreds of organisations all over the country and working with the likes of the National Theatre, Whitworth in Manchester, South as Wells, Nottingham Playhouse, Space, Liverpool, Everyman, Pendibus. Our, our con, icon, um, our literally, I could go on and on. There are hundreds of organisations all over the country who are doing some wonderful stuff. And it makes me very optimistic, or perhaps optimistic. Today, we're asking what role do cultural buildings of the future play in the civic, creative, and the environmental context? How do we make decisions fit for, that fit within the Paris ambition of less than two degrees warming? That's quite a challenge. How can we translate that big policy framework to our everyday lives and thinking? What role can cultural institutions play in today's biggest transitions, for example, sustainable cities, a clean energy infrastructure, and addressing biodiversity decline, which is, is something that um, we really need to start paying attention to? What kind of partnerships and support from funders and policy makers are really going to make this movement thrive? And how can we tend our buildings and our built estate so that they grow the values and the purpose that will nourish us all. And we have a brilliant panel this morning of three excellent practitioners to help us answer those questions, and I'm sure there's already some answers that are coming up um, from the room. Um, we've got Simon Browner, uh, Katie Lisbeth, and Steve Tompkins, who will all give short presentations. And then we, we're going to throw it open pretty quickly so that people can get dug in to what really matters to them. And we're going to start with Simon. Uh, who's the UK Programme Manager for, for Ashton and founder of co-founder of Fit for the Future Network. Simon combines his experience in public health, social policy and cycling to the service of the Ashton Awards, ensuring that Ashton winners, and he can, he's consistently doing, um, supporting those winners over the years to reach their maximum uh, potential, work in partnership and share their learning. And they have had a, a huge impact 
Um, Simon wants to seriously ramp up the role of local sustainability energy, sustainable energy in the UK and all the transnational benefits it brings. And here, I think. <laughs> This is like a traditional performance in itself, isn't it? The, the 30 seconds of the first slide.
The one that I think I will say is the reason the network works so well is we're strictly non-commercial. It's a peer-to-peer -peer network and we will not allow people to sell you things as part of those meetings. And this means you can trust the advice that you get. We have now more than 80 big property organisations in the network and it's growing all the time. So what I'm going to do now is just give you a couple of examples of projects which might help to bring the network to life. So this is a particular favourite of mine because when I'm not at work, I'm usually afloat somewhere. This is the RNLI. The RNLI have 236 lifeboat stations around the UK and Ireland. It's what their head of the states call their non-floating assets. And they're in the process of renovating every one of those. You can imagine with the location of these stations, what challenges that brings, and the fact that the RNI is pretty much led all by volunteers. I can't go into all of the projects that they've been working on, but I thought I might give you an example or two. So this slide behind me is the lifeboat station Exmouth. We were actually there recently running behavioural change workshops with their staff and volunteers. But this is a really interesting example. So every lifeboat, when it comes out of the water, has to be cleaned with huge quantities of water to remove the salt. This costs a lot of money. At this lifeboat station, they've installed rainwater harvesting systems to gather rainwater and to use that to clean the lifeboats. <laughs> Except it wasn't working. The water was going stagnant in the storage tanks and couldn't be used. Somebody from the Fit the Future Network said, have you thought about using copper down pipes? Copper has a natural antiseptic property. If you look on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see one of those down pipes which has been installed there. It solved the problem. That's now been rolled out across all the lifeboat stations, saving huge amounts of money on mains water. It's just one example of how Fit the Future Network can help. But what I really <coughs> like about the story of the RNLI is that when they started their energy-related work and their energy efficiency programmes, there was huge amounts of pushback from funders and volunteers and supporters asking why are we spending all this money on energy efficiency when our job is to save lives at sea. And it's a fair enough question, right? But when volunteer crews came back to a little warm lifeboat station after a call in the middle of the night, some of them started to change their mind. When the financial director started seeing significant savings as a result of the energy programmes which were being rolled out, others started to change their minds. But when the RNI bought 10 inshore lifeboats based on the savings they'd made from reducing their use of energy, nearly everyone in that organisation changed their minds. Linking the work that you do to the core objectives of your organisation is really important. And that's what can really help create that cultural change and allow you to take your staff and volunteers and customers with you. And just going back to that dating service for a moment, the RNI uses heat pump technology in all of its offshore lifeboats to heat those boats. Keith and Paul from the National Trust took all that learning from the RNI and they've now installed the UK's largest marine source heat pump in Plathmuth and Anglesey in Wales. That installation has allowed that state home to come completely off oil, to hugely reduce its fuel bills, and to put that money back into conserving that heritage building. And the network can help you do those kind of things too. So, one more example. Some of you might recognise this. This is Chatsworth House in Devon. Chatsworth House also has a large net estate. They have 400 cottages, 70 farms, hundreds of commercial properties. And most of these buildings are pre-1919. And I know from many of you in the audience, you will be dealing with heritage buildings, listed buildings, which come with all sorts of challenges too. So making these changes is challenging, but within the network we have many members who have treated hundreds of heritage grade one and two listed buildings we've learned some of those lessons already so we connected chatsworth and the team there with a number of organizations in our network and thanks to those connections they now install 15 biomass systems into their properties and these boilers are saving 270 tons of co2 a year 
That's about the equivalent of emissions of 125 UK homes. They're now going on to install more biomass boilers in their properties, and they're installing a large combined heat and power plant, which will eventually heat the house, the shop, the cafe, and other visitor buildings. And again, the money will go back into conserving Chatsworth House so that future generations can enjoy that too. This slide behind me is just some statistics from the Fit the Future network. Um, that number in the middle is the amount of energy that our members currently consume. That's coming down all the time, but it's huge. That 730 million kilowatt hours is the equivalent of you putting on 730 million microwaves on full power for an hour. To give you an idea of how much energy is used. And that energy, in terms of you buying it, would cost more than 100 million pounds. Just want to point out the potential savings there if you're making 10, 20 cent, 30 cent, 40 cent savings on energy. The slide also shows the number of organisations that we're working with and how many buildings they're managing. So you can see there are 40,000 buildings in the network, 19 World Heritage sites. And according to the Arts Council, you guys have something like 16,000 buildings between you. Some of which are on their journeys already, some of which are not. So those savings can be really interesting. And of those 40,000 buildings in our network, they're really interesting. They consist of pubs, railway stations, galleries, museums, university buildings, cathedrals, youth hostels, and even shepherd's huts. So I'm not going to argue that you need to do this work to save the planet, although clearly we do. And I'm not going to argue you need to do this because you believe in renewable energy. I want to persuade you to do this out of sheer selfishness. Because by saving energy, your organisation can put on more plays, preserve more artefacts, create more exhibitions, restore more paintings, fund more volunteers, and use your energy work to engage your audiences with new and different ways. And who doesn't want to do that? So my last slide. If you want to know more about the Fit for Future Network, you can talk to me, you can talk to Chloe or Hannah. Keith will be here, that's it, Keith's already here today. Come talk to us about the network. We're a try before you buy service. We're a not-for-profit. You can come and join the network for a year free of charge and see whether it's useful for you or not. Nearly everybody who joins as a member stays. If you want a taste of how the network works, come to our annual conference on the 17th of October, that's the slide behind me now, where you'll get to hear many more inspiring projects than I have the time to tell you about today. You can attend workshops, get personalised answers to the issues that you're facing, and meet some of those inspiring members of the network. And finally, at the beginning of this presentation, I said to you I'd talk to you about sustainable beer. One of our members is Adams Brewery. Some of you will know Adams Beer, it's one of my favourites, they're based in Southwold. They're leading the way with some support from the network in producing some of the most environmentally beer in the world by looking at their production processes and reducing their impacts. But they're also looking at how they distribute that beer and are now piloting electric vehicles to deliver that beer to their suppliers and customers. But not only that, they're pink, painting their electric vehicles bright pink because they want to provoke and encourage conversations with others around them. But again, they're not just doing this because it's the right thing. They're doing it because it makes really good business sense. And they're able to plow those savings back into their company's development. So the financial director of Adams, Richard, who now sits on the Fit the Future board, says their membership fees have been recovered endless times over based on the great advice they've got from their peers in the network. So I'll drink to that. Cheers. Published a lecture on wall painting, conservation, preventative conservation, 
conservation management, interpretation in conservation, heritage, science, and sustainability. And she's an accredited conservator, restorer, and trustee of the National Heritage Science Forum. So Katie's going to be talking more about collections and how they work within buildings rather than the buildings themselves. Thank you, Katie. open to the public. Um, 146 of those are accredited museums. They house, at last count, around 940,000 artifacts and historic feature, features and fixtures, uh, but we estimate that there's probably yet another, uh, another half a million to go before we've got a comprehensive picture about how much stuff we've got. And um, the brief for this was, how do we shape, construct and maintain building, buildings to deliver against this challenge for a less than two degree future. So I had a look at the built environment and its implications for how we preserve collections in situ, because that's our chief way of preserving heritage, cultural heritage, as far as collections are concerned. But I'm also going to touch on the social and economic bits, because without those other two pillars, whatever one does is kind of not fit for the future. <laughs> roll it with your thumb. Scroll down. It's like a roll wheel. Oh. <laughs> of many, many places, none of which are sustainable, otherwise they wouldn't have come to the Trust in the first place. They're sheltered under this big public purpose, public benefit umbrella. And um, we are an organisation that is pursuing a strategy of growth, so how does that fit with being frugal with one's resources and a sustainable future? It's kind of about economies of scale. The um, strategic framework is that by providing experiences that engage our audiences, we will produce the resources that we need to do our principal purpose, which is to look after the stuff that we, the special places that we're looking after forever, for everyone. Um, and then that, in turn, improves the offer to our audiences. So I'm sure, I don't need to point out to you that there's a bit of a lead and a lag in this. Um, you can see in the top left how visitor numbers have um, grown up to now 22.2 million as of the end of the last financial year. And our opening hours have pretty much doubled, so that we are going for 363 or 364 days worth of opening per year, as opposed to 160 odd that it was up to about five or six years ago. And our audience expectations are changing. They want more light, so the kind of daylight driven flat lighting that you see in the withdrawing chamber at Hardwick on the bottom left is kind of felt to be kind of dim for audiences who are more accustomed or wanting to see our epic contents shown in the truly dramatic way that their original owners would have commissioned them to embellish their impressive houses. And that's what's happened at Beckling Hall, the withdrawing chamber, and Mortgate tapestries on the right. So um, all of this leads to greater energy consumption. Nevertheless, our ambition is still to maintain, achieve a reduction in our energy use of 20% by 2020 when compared with the baseline year of 2009. And Keith, I know that in the various workshops will be looking at some of the technological stuff that I'll refer to a little bit um, as we go on. Oh, wow. So, as a conservator, a lot of the ways that I experience climate change is through the impacts of severe weather. And this weather, this slide shows the number of insurance claims and the value of those, those insurance claims over the past 15 years or so. And you can see that the trend for the number of events is increasing, although the actual cost of those events is declining. We peaked in 2007, which many of you may remember, but these events have become so frequent that in many ways it feels like business as usual for property, so they're beginning to take some of these events 
in their stride, as it was with House of Cockermouth, which um, was flooded in a kind of, what was it, 100 year event in 2009, and the force of the water barreling down the main street, taking bridges and masonry with it, took out building, um, built structures around the house, including the garden, flooded the basement, and it took a huge amount of time over the year to get the building back into operation again. And then this happened again, <coughs> six years later, 2015. But six months later, the garden had been reinstated and the house was open for business again. And so the learning from that event made, in effect, our use of that building far more resilient. The house felt where it was taken in their stride, the property started to put the building back into use again far, far more quickly. So what are the kind of lessons that I take away from these events? So these are some more of the 2007 events. The buying in Hampshire, you can see water which was pouring down the drive, then poured into the basement. Fortunately, it poured out again extremely quickly. And that was because the historic drainage had been put back into um, use some years before, actually to, to tackle a rising dam problem. And so consequently, the brushing out of water meant that it didn't hang around long enough to wet anything of any significance beyond the boiler, which I'm sure people like Keith would, Keith would have wanted to replace anyway. And thus gave us an opportunity to recast its technological equipment in a more sustainable fashion. And then the other things we learn is that historic materials like mine plaster, stone, they can be left to dry out and reused, thus maintaining all that locked up carbon compared to modern materials which have to be stripped out and discarded and consequently not do a great deal for our carbon footprint. So MDF, chipboard and so on, the skips that you see filled with the debris after people's houses like Embuscot Village were flooded are kind of, you know, that is a huge load of waste to accommodate within the planet. So um, there are lessons to learn from the resilience of traditional materials and how things which were built four hundred or so years ago and well are still maintainable and fit for purpose today. But it's not just the material properties themselves, it's how we use them. So some research which was done up in um, with historic Scotland at Glas in Glasgow demonstrates that the if you fit the frame well in historic buildings and use historic curtains and blinds, you can achieve exactly the same thermal performance as you can with less specified double glazing units. Putting in double glazing units into a leaky frame isn't going to help anybody. This may be a call to um, go back to the 1980s best two blinds and curtains that one has seen kind of swept out of any interiors today, but it's how we use buildings, buildings and machines for living in, that make them sustainable as well as the kit that we put in them. So that kind of goes into how we look after our buildings and in the trust partly because of frugal or frugality, our charitable purpose, we don't have huge amounts of money to throw at problems. Our emphasis is on maintenance, little and often, because that um, buys you a lot of heritage value. It's far less um, amount of spend per year than having to leave things to go into a safe terminal decline and spending them a lot of money every 30, 50, 100 years to put it back into a good state. And we find that with climate change impacts, that exposes any deficiencies that there have been in these maintenance schedules. So consequently, the ability of heritage materials to be readily maintained through low tech, through people, and you know that kind of is an economic, socio-economic benefit, is, is fundamental to the fact that they have lived with us for so long, and if we look after them in this way, that they should survive into the future. So some of the qualities about heritage materials, they're relatively inexpensive, they're robust, um, they're near at hand, they're easy to get hold of. All of those things help to make these buildings maintainable. So what about the technological quick fix? There's kind of a, a lot of desire for something that will solve all our problems without us having to do anything to change our own behaviour about this. The Trust has always had a pragmatic approach to controlling its environment for the benefit of collections. So whereas there have been very tight specifications um, that have, in effect, I think the museum community has replayed it um, for a very long time with very uh, variations of only plus or minus um, one degree allowed around their fresh temperature thresholds, 
we've adopted a strategy of focusing on the relative humidity because that's what makes organic materials swell and contract and fall apart or grow mold. And that we don't control temperature except to try and iron out the extremes so to avoid um, freezing and to put in upper temperature limits for energy conservation purposes. So we find that our temperature and um, relative humidity regimes are actually using about a third to a half of the energy that comfort heating would. So there's kind of some lessons about how you live in historic buildings. And I'll show you one of our radiators on the bottom left, and that's mimicking the performance of historic fire rooms, uh, historic fireplaces. And the fact about these things being easy to make is really important. Well, you've got an increasingly changing historic house staff community. They're all looking to progress from their um, basic jobs at the houses to management roles, so the throughput is rapid. So we need to equip this with technology that they can readily hand over to their, success, to their successors so that it's still used in the best and most efficient way. But not all the heritage buildings are perfect. Um, these are a couple of ones which were built at the end of the 19th century, that's Penn Rin on the bottom right, and Castle Drogo on the top right, which is in, um, uh, on Dartmoor. And uh, the top one was built for a uh, uh, newspaper magnet, the W.H. Smith family, the bottom one for coal mine owners. So they had lots of money, wanted the newest, casting the kind of most dramatic style of the past, and uh, kind of built modern technologies into these historic styles which had not been tested and have not proved fit for the future. So all the internal walls in the gaps, uh, double skinned walls of Castle Drogo were lined on the inside with bitumen coating which has cracked and failed and let in moisture. The windows have failed, the pointing has not worked and so there's been comprehensive leaking and, st and staining of lines you can see on the bottom left. And um, at Castle Drogo, the sheer scale and size of the building puts it kind of beyond the easy to maintain bracket of stuff. And so Keith has done epic work on Paul in kind of retrofitting it with energy efficient heating systems. We can put this stuff into historic buildings without it being too much of a struggle. Insulation is going into the floor voids and ceiling voids at Mill House in Kent. Probably as I speak, we've got photographs of insulation going into the ceiling voids at um, Plasnewood. All of those things are kind of straightforward, but we are faced with technological experimentations which have not necessarily taken account of that long term view which we now try to with design. So, how long should we be looking for these things to last? Um, this is another bit of built heritage, not the kind of house, but this is a breakwater at Mullion Cove, which was introduced at the end of the 19th century by a paternalistic landowner, attempting to give the fishing village a sustainable future with shrimps, which promptly swam away a mere five years later. And then the breakwater became more of a kind of decorative amenity place for people to enjoy walking up and down the coast. In the following 100 years, increasingly we found the repair, build, mounting of still we see to wreak havoc on this structure. And we did a, a conservation management plan which looked at various options and the kind of thing that would preserve it for as long or beyond my lifetime would be building a multi-million pound breakwater in the middle of that harbour. So going into consultation with the um, local community, the actual solution which has been adopted is to do the little and often maintenance until the point at which the costs of repair become no longer economically sustainable, at which point the um, cove will be allowed to moulder away and it will return to its pre-late 19th century appearance, which has been in for far longer than it has with the breakwater. So we can manage this change in a way that maintains value. So just my concluding slide is what does this mean for kind of buildings of the future by looking at buildings of the past? Core cabin on the left, um, epic storms in 2007 caused internal water features, unlike the ones at Chatsworth, which are external, we saw earlier, and we didn't have a duck in uh, view, that seems to be a little symbol of this meeting. But we that building, 1704, um, is still performing today, and we're able to adapt it, we're increasing the um, water spouts so that they can take these increased volumes of severe rainfall. And we're taking these things into consideration when we're building new structures. So he lives by the field and Clegg Bradley partnership on the top right in consultation with environmental engineers. They also 
designed the Chetworth um, shelter building on the bottom of the first straw bill footprint building in the middle. These might be the buildings we're looking after 100 years from now. I haven't put the shard up. Um, I don't know whether we should would be landed with the shard in the future years, but kind of thinking about that heritage for the future will be our job. You know, these are different buildings, so we're always going to have to adapt our methods for the future and to be fit for the future as well. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Work with him from every man beat the shard for the room selling price two years ago. Uh, Steve, um, I'm really pleased to have Steve on the panel. He's a, he's a founding director of Path Topics. For anybody who's deeply embedded in the arts and cultural sector, he won't need an introduction because Steve has been one of our most, if not our most, um, exciting architects over the last decades who's really built sustainability into the heart and soul of arts as a value rather than just as a, as a technical change. Um, he leads his, his studio, Howard Tompkins, he leads the studio's performing arts portfolio. He, he, he's worked with projects such as the National Theatre, Everyman, Bush, uh, Young Vic, Albra Music, Northwall, Bassiat Centre, Theatre Royal Bath, and on and on it goes. Um, Steve has worked with Julie's Bicycle for some time. He's an expert advisor hugely inspirational person, and in fact, really, is an artist, not just an architect. So, here's Steve. Thanks very much. I don't know if we can get the lights down a little bit, we? just to get a little bit more resolution on the screen. Being an architect, I'm going to show you lots of pictures as well as do lots of talking. I want to concentrate on cultural buildings in the performing arts sector, primarily, for this part of the presentation. We know that sustainability is not just about kilowatts, it's not just about carbon, it's about society's long-term capacity to behave in more intelligent, less destructive ways to itself and to other species on the planet, as Alison alluded to in her introduction. So whilst Paris is a landmark, it's an absolutely crucial means towards that end, I would contend that our stock of cultural buildings, particularly for live performance is also another crucial means to the end of achieving a better society, a more sustainable society. They're the places where we share our common humanity, they're the places where we find cultural and communal rootedness, they're the places where we can find moments of respite, of optimism and delight in the world which is otherwise potentially increasingly depressing. So they are absolutely important components of achieving sustainability in and of themselves. We're probably all in the room today because we would agree with those priorities, but we also know we've got a huge stock of cultural buildings which exist, we've got a huge stock of existing buildings which currently have no real purpose, but they're fairly sound, and we know we've got an environmental emergency on our hands. So it's reasonable for us to ask ourselves in those circumstances, why we would ever want to build a new cultural building? Why would we ever want to spend the enormous amounts of energy, financial, and time resources that a new build project takes to achieve? Somebody told me, I don't know if this is true or not, but they said, if you buy a Toyota Prius, it will take more energy in its manufacture than you could save in an entire lifetime. Um, of not running a clapped out old gas cluster. And I think that's a really interesting challenge for us. It's an interesting challenge for the day because if we focus too narrowly on energy saving, on revenue saving costs, we might be missing a big picture. So somehow we have to find more intelligent, more connected, more humane, more creative strategies for not only looking after our own stock of existing buildings, but for finding new opportunities <coughs> where they already exist and without having to spend megatons of carbon in order to arrive at a building which may or may not be very excellent, but perhaps, I would contend, the damage may already have been done. And perhaps if we thought hard about it from the outset, spent longer in conversation, investigation and forethought, then we might overall have saved ourselves huge amounts of carbon. 
The planet doesn't mind its capital revenue carbon. We must remind ourselves. So there will always be a case for new buildings. You know, they can transform communities, they can transform whole regions, they can introduce and support a new art form. And I'll talk about one of those occasions um, at Liverpool in a moment. Roberts, I'm glad to say, is here. He was a key protagonist in that process. So I'm going to just illustrate very quickly and simply some of the strategies and organisations that I've worked with over the years have come up with to try and work, I think, in a more intelligent, more light-footed, more reflective way about how cultural buildings can contribute to the overall sustainability of our society, and I think then by extrapolation the sustainability of our planet. So how we motivate ourselves to do the right thing in many ways. So, can I get this to work is the next question. Uh, I really can't. That's really not on my slide. That looks like a desktop. <laughs> hey ho. Great, I hope you haven't gone to sleep. <laughs> so joy per kilowatt is my metric to propose to you. It's about not just energy saving, but it's about what that energy does. It's interesting to remember that under the Brayon system, and, and the building's energy efficiency is judged by kilowatts per square metre of the building. If you've got a very low kilowatt per square metre of building, then you're really good. But that means that 3,000 seat, useless, empty, therefore unvisited, unheated, unventilated, unlit building will score more highly than a tiny shoestring, volunteer made venue packed out every night, heaving, everybody sweating, leakage or get out. Back to the building that then scores lower. So something, somewhere is wrong with our metric. And I think this is a much more interesting one for those of us that are, that, that are building and thinking about cultural venues. Mm -hmm. Come on. Down. Down. Great. We're there. Okay, so some strategies. Small provocations. Building can be temporary without being ungreen, I would argue. When we worked on the National Theatre, they could have gone to a temporary venue for the Cotslow and the Dorfman, it would have cost as much as building this building. So we decided to try and do something which would advertise the credentials of the NT, somebody that wanted to behave in greener ways, wanted to attract more audiences of a different demographic, wanted to make the whole way we think about visiting the theatre more interesting, more radical, more sustainable. This is a naturally ventilated building that looks after itself. To an extent, those of you that have been there will know that it gets really hot and it gets really cold. It's got its own weather system, but we don't particularly mind because we're in a situation where we will forgive it because it's doing something interesting. And hence, I think that we have to be careful about very strict metrics for temperature control. As you were saying, plus or minus one degree centigrade. Why? You know, put on a jumper, take off the jumper, do something else, move around, bring a fan, fantastic. All these things are human responses which make the experience more interesting. We don't want to be slaves to technology because we mustn't let technology rule this conversation. It's a tiny building, it's made of wood, made out of four by two planks, bits of old insulation, but it has an extraordinary effect. This image went around the world internationally, we've had inquiries from 12 or 20, in fact, international organisations who would like something like this. It's an archetype, it's a safe house, it's a place which generates its own centre of gravity, it was all done for less than a million pounds. Likewise, the interior, plywood, recyclable, co-opting parts of the front of house space, putting a carpet down and putting some lights, that was pretty much all we did. And yet, it's a really powerful and memorable environment. It's now demolished, it's been recycled, other versions, I think and believe, will happen around the country, I hope around the world. Temporary spaces, in general, I think, are incredibly effective. It's not just the physical presence of these buildings which is um, memorable and important. It's what happens about the way they remap our perception of cities. A couple of examples from a few years ago. The Almeida, when they were redeveloping, worked with a developer who was developing this building over in Shoreditch. They got the site for free. We simply put some rate seating into it. 
And the Abbey made an 800 seat auditorium with borrowed scaffolding, borrowed seating systems, borrowed children's lights, borrowed turf for the stage, which was then given back later. Very, very low in the energy of this process. Just a good idea, a piece of opportunism. It sold out for the year, it changed people's perceptions of, of that area, and it left a memorable mark on the cultural landscape at the time. It was so successful that a year later, our neighbor did the same thing. Development site at King's Cross, the most salubrious part of King's Cross at the time, as you can see. But again, using almost nothing. We borrowed turf for the roof, we got some old plastic which was lying around for the walls. We used gobo lights. We took the plan exactly as it was, we were trying to make it an architecturally perfect experience. You can see it wasn't, it was round shackle. No theatre designer in a textbook would ever come up with a space like this, and yet it was kind of amazing. And the fact that it was bonkers, and the fact that you couldn't really breathe properly because it was so hot at the end of the evening, <laughs> and the fact that it was made by the production crews with bits of scaffolding, and the tools that they used for making the sets, a space like this, really just with get a light and a mirror, becomes a memorable bar, and people for years afterwards talk about this as the night where so-and-so happened, or the night where I met so-and-so, and so this Temporary intervention became a kind of permanent artifact in the cultural architecture of the city. And we used, with the young Vic, when we came to redevelop that building, that sense of continuing that temporary bricolage, extending the cultural memory of the site. This was the old young Vic, the temporary building in 1970, should have lasted five years, and we decided to keep the good parts of it. It's a beautiful auditorium, there's a fantastic foyer, which is an old British shop which survived the wartime bombs. And we just worked with what we had. We added on new elements, we saved what was beautiful, we knocked down what wasn't. Respectful, perceptive by the young bit as an organisation, unsentimental, incredibly deft, and confident piece of commissioning architecture. And the building has become a living room for the locality, it's not just a bit of foyer. Because it works hard, it works densely, it's always round, sometimes to a fault. Often you come out of a show and you can't get a seat, you can't get a drink because the bar's already full. Nice problem, huh? Nice problem to have. Because it means that the organisation is bedded in its community and in its locality. And the auditorium was already very beautiful. All we had to do was make some tweaks and it stays adaptable, it stays vivid, it carries on its memory. Theatre Royal Bath developed a really extraordinary young people's theatre program, I think, over very many years without a dedicated venue. They only decided that they would spend resource and capital when they knew they had an absolutely cast iron case for inhabiting it. It wasn't a speculation on their part. There was a building came up to say on nearby, non purpose built, pretty terrible inside. So together we gutted it and put a small classical auditorium in, although in this case it's made of bits of corrugated plastic, some felt, um, some adaptable seats, and quite a, a, quite a sophisticated lighting and rigging system, which means that lots of art forms can use it. Surface people like it because it's epic and vertical. Children like it because it's fun, they can race around it, they can kick it and bump into it, it doesn't hurt them. The old building gave us free texture, out again. Retexture and daylight. Well, doesn't like that slide. And we use the actual lighting means simply to up the voltage literally on the exterior of the building when we wanted to do it. Other than that, almost nothing. The bush just down the road, really imaginative piece of building commissioning, really imaginative set of conversations, embedded themselves with local politicians, they understood the movers and shapers of the property market, the developers next door, the local authorities, they built those relationships over months, probably years. And then when the moment came, they were in a fit state to move fast, fleet footedly, moved into the old library building, which moved into to Westbury, respectively. And we did almost nothing. We squatted in the building, we spent just over half a million pounds, and we got them in there. And that's the state that, that Madden is inheriting, and now working with him, his successor team the next phase of that building to make it more street legal. There was no insulation, there was no double glazing, no ventilation systems. <coughs> it was a real spot. 
Now we're working on the second phase because we've proved that it works, we've proved what we need, consulted with audiences. Everything we made on this um, building was pretty much homemade, there was no money, so we made the lights, we salvaged the bar from bits and bobs down in the basement, we worked with the painter to put coats of paint on, almost nothing else. And we stripped out all the extraneous stuff in the library room, and it turned into an eccentric, but again memorable, space where a lot of beautiful things have happened. Sometimes architecture doesn't need to be discernible at all. Sometimes the building that we can find ourselves in only needs us to just shut up and leave it alone. There's so much beautiful texture. This is St. Moulton's um, for old music, where we played with some existing buildings, pretty much curated some demolition, and added one new room in the centre of what was otherwise completely existing stock. But we curated what we found. The organisation knew that what attracted artists to Oldborough is its sense of emptiness, its sense of melancholy, that feeling of salty mud, smell, air, wafting through those spaces. That's what is inspiring for artists. So the job of the architect is to make sure you don't compromise that. <coughs> simple room and one moment of fun to put a, a single studio into an old ruined dovecot um, which in itself is a sort of sculptural moment to announce the building but very restrained and very very resource like all the foundations all the substructure all the main fabric of the building already there already free no decoration no elaborate textures because it's all there for free this stuff is around and so Perhaps we need to spend our time and energy finding those things, having those conversations, setting up the structures, instead of saying, okay, what do we need? Now let's build it all for new. And those processes can go on <laughs> for years and years. Battersea Arts Centre we've been working with for 12 years to transform Battersea Town Hall slowly, working with artists, working with production teams, making small incremental changes, not responding to a huge master plan, taking it a step at a time, acupuncture signage, stripping back existing textures. This was a black box with a bleacher seating system in it. Underneath is the most beautiful council chamber. The revenues have increased by a constant because they're just doing almost nothing. Taking upon the staircase and putting a stair carpet, wrapping it into seats and tables, means that it's full of kids every day. They come in, they play on it, they race on it, they jump on it, um, and it costs virtually nothing. One unexpected moment in Bath Arts Centre was the fact that the Grand Hall burned down 18 months ago. It could have been a catastrophe for a master plan capital project. But actually, because of the way that Bath Arts Centre had been approaching it, it simply became an opportunity. It was one more significant event in the history of the building, which could be encapsulated, celebrated, and marked. So we are going to leave the Grand Hall walls as the fire left it. They're very, very beautiful. And we're going to put back a, a new ceiling where the plaster ceiling was lost. But this time it's an open filigree of timber through which we can winch and light, etc., etc. Sometimes, very occasionally, all those strategies for reuse and recycling aren't enough. And it would be interesting to hear from Robert, no doubt, later. The Everyman in Liverpool was one of those occasions where the organisation spent many years looking at reusing the building, looking at alternative strategies, concluding in the end, after an exhaustive analysis, that the only thing to do to keep the organisation alive and to keep that sense of civic ownership was to rebuild. Now, in rebuilding, there's a huge responsibility. I don't think any of us in the arts should be building cultural buildings unless they are exemplary in terms of their sustainability. Sean was saying for the over the years, <coughs> taking that incredibly seriously. Most projects will, partly because there's pressure on us from funders to achieve standards, but I think more importantly it has to come from the heart. It has to be a building, if we build new, that is absolutely rooted in its ability to be exemplary, to give a message about optimism and sustainability in the widest sense, rather than just sit this for purpose for an organisation or even an individual city. So my conclusion is that 
we have to be smarter, we have to spend more time, we mustn't rush into spending huge amounts of capital resource when we could be having conversations, when we could be thinking harder. I think we need to empower funders and boards and trustees to be more interested in intelligent insight and dialogue than in slick, half-baked visuals from design teams. I think architects need to be given permission to behave more like trustees than hired guns in procuring buildings. And I think overall, we simply have to take a step back and see the procurement of cultural buildings in the perspective of global sustainability. Thought, imagination and dialogue are carbon neutral. They will always result in a better building. Sometimes they'll result in a much smaller, less complicated building. And occasionally they'll result in no buildings at all. Thank you. effectively made the business case um, so via a network right through to a really profound recognition of the role of the arts and culture particularly in this uh, global context and how it is that we can fill so much of that gap that is missing in the public space around imbuing sustainability um, both with the urgency that the, the climate change and 1.5 agenda requires but with a joy per kilowatt context in which it actually becomes, if we slow down, we use our imagination and we look at our putting artistic processes right at the front of our sustainability challenges, that actually this is where transformation really sits. So um, this is a chance for you uh, um, to ask questions. Um, I'm going to throw it open because we're actually a bit over time immediately, but if anybody, sorry about this, if anybody should I do that? I know that we're recording it, but it's a bit off-putting. If anybody does have um, questions that they want to kick off with immediately, please uh, do so. For any questions, because we are live streaming and subtitling, uh, please say your name, say the organisation that you, um, you come from, and then speak, if you can, really clearly, um, so that we can capture it. So would anybody, before I take over the agenda, would anybody like to ask any of our panellists a question? Okay, we have a roving mic. I hope it works. If not, shout over here. Yes, sir. I'm the World Shakespeare Company. Um, <laughs> I'll try again. Adam Dixon from the Royal Shakespeare Company. One, something we want to try and do is to promote the sustainability work that we're putting into our buildings so that members of the public, when they come in, can appreciate the work that we're doing and hopefully be part of what it is that we're trying to achieve. It's quite difficult to get that message across in an appropriate way. Can you offer any suggestions as to how we might achieve that? Would anybody like to kick off on that? Yeah. Katie? So I speak into this one. Uh, the, um, well, so this is speaking from the historic house environment, but we've got a kind of program around conservation in action, where it's allowing the kind of back of house to come front of house and to let audiences interact with the people who are at the cutting edge and they find it fascinating because there's nothing that enlivens a place in a story better than people interpretation panels kind of but kind of fiddling with stuff talking to people who are the real, real practitioners does bring it to life we uh, so um with ashton we have a program called seeing is believing 
Um, and we use that program to take politicians, funders, policy makers to see things for themselves because we think that's really transformative. So that might be a community energy project or it might be a new building. And as Katie's saying, actually taking people into the bowels of the building, showing them the heat pumps, introducing them to members of the community who benefited from a community energy project, those are the things actually we find are really interactive. And people are actually much more interested in seeing the plant rooms sometimes than they are seeing the galleries above. So kind of mixing those two elements sometimes works very well. Steve, yeah, I, I probably have a slightly heretical um, response in that I, I, I think the the overarching need is for the venue and, and the work to be vivid and rich and transformative. I think the secondary means by which that's done and, and sustainable practice is, is one of those at, as a technical level. I always get anxious when that is foregrounded too much. It's, it's probably a personal thing. Um, it's the same reason I have a phobia about video screens in arts venues because I, for me they have the same effect as a television in the pub where you're trying to have an intimate conversation with somebody and you keep getting distracted by the football without a soundtrack in the corner. So there's, there's something about intrusiveness of technology and information into an environment which, which is about poetry or transformation or the chance to sort of empty out and concentrate on something, almost meditate on something else. I know this is, sounds perhaps idealistic and slightly bonkers, but I, I was always, in the, the spaces that we do, try and find a space where that can happen as an adjunct rather than be plastered over the, the building as a whole. Because sometimes, I, if one isn't careful, the means of communication can cloud the end in, in itself. So I think there's, there's a, just a note of caution, and that doesn't answer your question, <laughs> but may, maybe parenthesize it somewhere which isn't right in the middle of the heart of, of, of your operation. I think those things can be subtle and implicit and subliminal, and the proof is in the pudding because you can quietly publish your data and you can thrive as an organization. So perhaps it's a long-term strategy rather than a short-term hit. Can I add a couple of things to that? Um, first of all, just pure nuts and bolts. JB's got a communications guide on the website. We'll make sure that you are sent a copy, which has got all the sort of top tips and how you put signage in and how you might attract audiences and those all the sort of bits that tours, all the kind of practical approaches that you can take to communicating positively. But I think there's something very profound about what Steve has said. And one of the things that I hope is going to come out today is the relationship between vision, organisational vision and mission and sustainability and putting it into the very heart of it, at which point what happens, and we've seen this over and over again at JB, is that actually the organisation transforms itself from being an organisation that does sustainability to being a sustainable organisation. Mm. And it sort of, it, instead of going outwards that way, it goes in. And the internalisation of all the values and the purpose and the sort of beautiful existential arc that sustainability offers us, particularly as arts and culture, actually just naturally permeates um, through and I think that that's a really 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 profound thing that and, and that, that we, we it's a big challenge to us all as arts and cultural organizations this is one of the very very precious things that we have as a community and one other thing which is that the arts and cultural in, uh, sector is coming together for a big season around uh, the last six months of 2018 where we're going to be uh, curating a whole variety of commissioned pieces, but also practice. So what we do is, as, a, as a community, celebrating environmental sustainability. Um, and so there is a moment that is, is emerging out of the calendar, uh, which is going to be that moment where we say as a cultural and an artistic community, this is, this is coming from our hearts. So I think there's something very important there too. Thank you very much. Does anybody from the audience have anything that they'd like to contribute to Adam? Any thoughts, or should we move on to another question? There's somebody up at the top. Um, Julie, that's why I'm independent consultant. I just wanted to add that actually the, 
Um, the process of transformation itself is a great occasion to communicate, and the National Trust has done that in, amazingly in many places, like, for example, Durham, where during the process of preparing the roofs, mm -hmm. the Trust, I believe, paid quite a bit more for the scaffolding to be um, accessible during the works, but actually made up for it with all the visits and all the visitor interest that they got during the works. It was uh, an absolutely amazing opportunity to visit works in action, including insulation being put on the roof, but also obviously conservation work. Um, I also have a question for the panel more generally about display energy certificates, because um, they're in public buildings, sometimes poorly displayed, sometimes reasonably prominent. Um, knowing that a lot of cultural buildings do receive at least some public funding, do you think that maybe a voluntary pledge of some sort would be useful, or is it just not sexy enough to engage the public? And also the fact that the methodology isn't that meaningful. Are you, can I just clarify, are you asking if people should use DEX, Display Energy Certificates, as their, as their public profile? <laughs> as an option, yes. And yeah, do you think it would be useful, or we need to find a better way? Would anybody like to respond to that? So thank you very much for your kind words about Dereham and that was one of the few but also Croom Park has done this where we created a sky cafe on the scaffold that was being built to kind of repair the roof where the building works actually saw an increase in visitor numbers and that was because there was an offer. So I think kind of the challenge is how you frame the message and how you stage manage the experience and that was really embedded in the whole way that it was done at Dereham, it, um, we tried it at Castle Drogo, but it wasn't kind of theatricalised, perhaps, as successfully. It's more difficult somehow trying to climb up a tower on, on Dartmoor. Um, so the deck thing, um, I think reference to standards helps, but where you put that signage and stuff is really important. So again, that it doesn't act as the distractor, it's how it kind of supports what you're doing. So um, it's kind of clever ways about how you would incorporate that information throughout your literature. And I guess the other is what is people's recognition of those decks that makes it worth doing it. So there's a kind of community support benefit that shows we belong to the club, I suppose. But how you kind of frame it, again, has to be consistent with the show that you're trying to put on. So. Can I just say something about how, how you talk about energy? So you talk to most people about a kilowatt hour. Do you know what a kilowatt hour is? Most people don't, and I think there's something important that I was starting to say in my presentation about translating energy savings into a currency that you and your staff and your volunteers and your customers and your clients understand. So that might be puppies, or it might be footpaths restored, or it might be paintings restored. Translating that into something that people understand and engage with is really important. So Keith will talk to you about the work that they do in the National Trust. But everybody in the National Trust knows the value of a membership, what it costs and how hard it is to convert people into members. Now if you convert energy into a currency membership that people understand, it has much more resonance. Those kind of certifications in lobbies of buildings are ignored hugely. I think there are much more interesting ways to do it. Just to give you one other example, so one of our award winners, Global Action Plan, working with big corporates to try and save paper, actually calculated how much paper organisations used, and then they took the paper crates, the boxes that the reams of paper come in, and created towers in the foyer of the building to show just how much paper people use. People responded to that because they saw it as a visual cue. So I think engaging around kind of meaningful units, converting them, does help in many ways. Can I... Uh, Maybe just add that um, I think it's always a good idea to encourage organisations to um, be in competition with themselves and with each other to, to achieve standards. And I think it's also good to have the threat of being shamed by not having done enough and for that to be made publicly visible. Having said that, I, I think the, the criteria by which decks are calculated and by extension the way in which the BRIAM system works those of you that facilities managers look, looking at BRIAM scores. I, th I think we need to be more sophisticated about the metrics. I'm, I'm assuming that we are all believers in the importance of, of doing these things. So from that point, where do we move now? How do we as a sector try and nuance the 
criteria by which these certifications or which these scores are arrived at. We all know for a fact, if you've done a capital project, you will have spent hundreds of hours trying to get three extra Brian points because one of your funders insists on a certain standard. That can probably use far more carbon in the process than you would ever have saved by getting those whatever it was. You know, there, there, there is the, the, uh, the usual absurdity of trying to put hundreds of wildlife habitats on every single building, perhaps at the cost of some much more important criterion which isn't acknowledged or valued under the weighting of, of a Brian process. So we need, we need to be careful, we need to be more sensitive, we need to be more intelligent, and I think we need to be more proactive in engaging with the organisations, all, all of which come with the best intentions and telling them how together we can improve the metrics and therefore the certification becomes more meaningful um, and more active going forward. Are there any other points that anybody wants to bring up on that one? Just, just on that point, it's worth mentioning that within the Fit for Future Network, there's an energy managers group that meets on a regular basis and it tackles those kind of thorny issues around building standards how to measure and monitor energy. Lots of organisations don't necessarily know how to measure the energy that they have. And the other thing to say about BRIAM, so Innovate UK published a report earlier in the year looking at BRIAM excellent buildings. So the BRIAM standard as they were empty compared to how the building's performing one or two years later, hardly any building met the BRIAM standards a year or two later because there were issues with the installation of equipment in the building, people hadn't been trained to use it, they were creating artificial environments that people weren't happy in. So the kind of examples from my organisation are air conditioning so severe at times, we find staff bringing in fan heaters that they're running under the desk, so you get these feedback loops going round and round. So there are these kind of energy insanities that go on in buildings and finding the solutions to those, I absolutely agree with Steve, making buildings places people want to be in that are comfortable and controllable are really important. I just wanted to add a little coda and, and offer a celebration of Robert Longthorne from Liverpool Everyman, who was absolutely instrumental, the director of development for that project. Robert obsessed over the detail of actually how we took sustainability seriously, how we measured it, how we analysed it, and he's been equally obsessive in, in collecting data, enforcing the use of the building, because as you say, the passive human interaction with the building is just as important, if not more important, than the hardware that you install. So, and Can I add to that? Uh, I think just very quickly that um, there's also the other end of the scale is too much data. So I think this is where the Arts Council did something very smart, which was to ask people to have a snapshot of their data, which massively increased literacy. Yeah. So there's a balance between what's too much and what's too little. And something I'd just like to sort of say, and, and it was, it's taking up a point, I think, that both Simon and Steve have made, which is that we, through the work that we've been doing with Arts Council across um, these thousands of organisations who are filling in their data profiles on an annual basis, we're actually in conversation with SIBSI, who are responsible for producing the data, and actually there are, there's a much greater and more proactive relationship that we can all have with the likes of SIBSI about actually putting our data into a much more accurate context so JB's now got uh, cultural benchmarks which differ from the uh, original citizen bench benchmarks because we've got much more nuanced data. So if we can pull together an appropriate amount of appropriate data, we can actually have a much more proactive relationship with those bodies that are consigned to create decks and create the, the regulatory requirements to which we are required to perform. So there's also something about us speaking up and out with the knowledge that we've, we've built over time. Um, did you finish, Steve? Sorry, I, I yeah. was a bit hurried. <laughs> uh, is, would anybody else like to ask any questions either to yourself or, or to the panel? Okay, we've got one over here and then one over here. One over and one over there. Hello, um, thank you. Um, you and Uber, Wallace Collection. I just wondered about, uh, does anyone also come to think we should actually speed up educating people about sustainability, or do you think the pace is the right? The pace? In which we educate people. Okay. So, that, would anybody like to front this huge question? about how we speak about sustainability in a wider context. I'll have a go, yeah. Go. Um, 
I, yes, we should. Absolutely, we should. I think it should perhaps be the biggest priority for all of us. I, I would like to see it as the number one item on everybody's business plan because unless we sort it, there will not only be any business plans, there won't be any organisations, there won't be a society. I mean, this is real, this stuff. This isn't hypothetical. It's happening. We are collectively in an extraordinarily powerful position, I think, because, we, because culture is such an active and vivid communicator across the board. If we took the decision to take this on as our number one priority, over and above artistic output even, over and above the value of important historic fabric even, because all of those things are secondary by definition. If we take seriously the first premise that we are in an emergency, then if we had, a, you know, that we had the proverbial meteorite heading towards us and it was going to hit us in 20 years' time, boy, we'd be mobilised. And yet here we are still, and we're wondering whether, oh, should we do this, should we do that? Collectively, we are still wondering that. Um, and it's, it's maddening and enervating and depressing, and we know that if we're too shrill and if we're too assertive, everybody gets put off. If we're not, then nothing happens and we hate ourselves. So I'd go for the former. <laughs> Would anybody like to add? I want to say two things. One of them is that if you look at the members of the Fit for Future Network and you guys in the room, you look at the combined membership of those organisations, millions for the National Trust, millions for the RNLI. Tate Modern has hundreds of thousands of members. If you collectively add up that membership, you are reaching a sizable population of the UK. And actually messaging from organisations like yours and ours are much more trusted than messaging from governments and others. So there's a real opportunity to be leaders in this field by talking about the work that you're doing and helping and encouraging your members to understand how they can engage too. But there's another issue of leadership for me which is really important. That many organisations who are embarking on these journeys, some who are far down the road, have issues to deal with at a financial level. If your capital is invested heavily in fossil fuels, you are undermining all the work that you're doing in your organisation. So one of my other jobs is working, looking at divest and invest issues, encouraging organisations to take money out of fossil fuels, put some of that into renewable energies and other ethical sectors so that you aren't undermining yourself. And that messaging is also clearly important for your members and your customers because you're leading by example too. I wondered when that was going to come up. It's a really important issue. Katie, do you want to add anything? Well, I think it's the thing about keeping it real, because I think if you, you need tub thumpers, I guess, to spearhead the revolution and, and make stuff happen. But unless people can translate it into their lives, it doesn't really have any traction. And I think it's constant drip feed. I don't think it's beating people over the head with it, because there's nothing worse than the preachy auntie National Trust telling you how you should lead, live your lives. It's kind of being the environment that they want to be in through which you subliminally get those messages. So it's that kind of fronting up on the message may get perverse consequences as well. I think we just need to be sophisticated and, you know, a, a mixed economy. Thank you very much. I know there's two more questions at least. Do we have one over here? Uh, this is from the Twitter stream. Uh, this is from Sarah Parker, a sustainability and energy management consultant. And she says, uh, what do the panel see as the greatest barriers to their sustainable and low carbon initiatives, uh, I guess, within which they're sort of responsible or agency? Okay, should we be quick about this? The big barriers to your sustainability initiatives, would somebody like to front this one, Steve? Um, for us, I, I think it's the priorities of the building procurement system and the constraints under which organisations have to work financially, organisationally. Um, I think it's, uh, there's a lead, this lead and lag business. So sustainability was kind of a, a happy conversation to have in the early 2000s, but with the economic recession, the economic pillar became much more important. Mind you, is that that important since we're taking a long view? Uh, I mean, I think for my organisation, it's about we don't talk about the really positive benefits of sustainable energy. So we don't talk about how that lifts people out of fuel poverty, how it puts money back into local communities 
how it makes buildings more efficient. You know, all those positive things that we would want as individuals, we have a responsibility to sell. And the people that really understand that are the people who've been involved. So if you take an example of a project he's been running in Snowdonia and Bethesda, a community share offer for big renewable programs which benefit the community, you talk to Keith about how many people have put small amounts of money into that share offer because they understand how it's going to transform their local economy bring down the price of energy and make the place they live in a better place to be. Those are the kind of messages I think are the important ones, not the doom and gloom ones, but the positive consequences of our actions. Yeah, and I think from the arts uh, community, I think I, I, it, I, it mirrors all of these. So these are very systemic barriers, but also I think what's happened um, increasingly is happening is just people beginning to realise just how important this is to their artistic missions. And that actually, as Steve said, it's beginning to be a major driver across the arts. So that's something about seeing the, the ever-present relevance of this to everything that people are doing. And that has been a barrier. But now it's been, it's been increasingly understood. And actually, it's generating a huge amount of new energy, which is very exciting. Over there. Um, hello, I'm Sarah Woodbury from Royal Society of Protection of Birds. I just want to thank everyone for some really inspiring talks. It's been great coming here this morning and getting a fresh uh, boost. Um, I just want to make a plea, really, so that, you know, don't forget wildlife. Please do incorporate homes and wildlife in buildings because um, not just ducks, but um, <laughs> swifts, bats, um, house sparrows have all been declined, particularly in London, um, and we do need to give them homes. And I just wondered if the, any of the panel have got some really good examples where they've, where they've done this and they've got wildlife into their projects. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and my comment is about the extreme, of course, rather than the, the absolutely valid imperative. Um, we, we tend to be into urban bees at the moment. Um, a lot, lot of the work we're doing at Bassey Arts Centre and the National Theatre um, is around... Um, bees. But at Oldbury it was really interesting because there's an um, embedded um, pipistrelle bat population. So we had to actually invent some really sophisticated bat architecture, both temporary venues and permanent venues um, for the bat population. And they live in the, the roof cows, which are the traditional maltings um, objects. So actually it was great for us as architects because we hate form not following function. So it, we were actually able to put these roof cows back with a, with a true purpose. So, and we've also got authentic guano um, shedding down the roofs, which is another mark of authenticity as far as I'm concerned. Um, I think wildlife appreciates good design. So I'm aware of kind of some interventions which have been designed to house bat populations where they've turned up their noses to, to them and gone elsewhere, often to heritage buildings. So my colleague David Bullock, who is head of conservation in the Trust, has been working with the Council for the Care of Churches or whatever it's called these days around the fact that kind of big barn-like structures are places that certain sorts of bat like to inhabit. So if that's a kind of value which these heritage structures can contribute to the world, then that may be a purpose of maintaining them and then they embellish the landscape and deepen the quality and beauty of our lives in a way they should, rather than being converted into homes. And it's worth just saying within the Fit for Future Network, there are lots of conversations going on about sustainable gardening, lots of conversations going on about ecosystems, so Scottish canals, the Canals and Riverway Trust, all those organisations are looking at biodiversity, and those conversations are happening as a matter of course, whilst looking at kind of broader energy issues. So there's a lot of interest in making things more sustainable and more biofriendly in those settings. OK, and I just want to ask Claire to talk a bit about extraordinary stuff that happened across the arts. Thanks. Um, just to respond um, in terms of some of the projects which we brought together in the Fit for the Future Guide, um, in terms of nature and biodiversity, Chichester Festival Theatre is a really fantastic example. They are based in parklands and sensitive landscaping and development was really important and they linked very much to the um, Sussex Biodiversity Plan, and we've been working with um, Transition Chichester and a range of organisations. I think that has been a fantastic example. There's also the Whitworth Art Gallery, there's trees, uh, bees at the Tate. 
The Royal Opera House has built all its production facilities with uh, grass seeding <laughs> roofs. So all, there's, all, there's all sorts of things happening, actually, in a micro sense, right across the arts community. They have woken up, I think it's very fair to say, to not just the issues of biodiversity, but for the, to the joys of biodiversity in their spaces. And Katie wanted to say something too. Well, just say, it's not an easy thing to do, um, uh, cultivating land for biodiversity. And I think some of the trickiest messaging that's been happening for the Trust in recent weeks has been over um, sustainable land use versus huge profit farming purposes and the way we may need to adapt historic land practices to do it for the future. So in a way that might be the more awkward place to have a conversation than it is around cultural buildings where we seem to have got quite a lot of will to do something. So both of our speakers just want to say something very short else as Katie did. Steve? I, I just wanted to um, thank everybody for, for coming and, to, and to, I unfortunately have to leave after this session but you know, I, I would really like our studio to be in touch with, with you collectively and continue to have the conversation. We're open for that conversation, so, so please, if you want to continue it um, online or, or through email or come to the studio and have a cup of tea, please do. Thank you. Thank you. And I wanted to say something just quite cheeky uh, with my Ashton Awards hat on. Uh, call for entries for our awards programme is open at the moment and there is a sustainable buildings category. If you want to kind of escalate your achievements into the public gaze, it may be a good opportunity to do that. So just to encourage you to have a look at our website and see whether you have any great examples which you think would fit. My colleagues would kill me if I didn't say that. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've had a really full morning. Um, so thank you very much. If there are other questions that people feel that they want to ask. Could JB team please put up hands? There's a few of us. There's two there and two here. Please do ask, and a couple by the side, please do come and ask us. If there are questions that you would have liked to have had answered but haven't been, do bring them in and we will send them out to the community. Um, we've actually got, we're slightly over. No, we're not. We're on time. Um, we're, we've got until 2 o'clock before lunch. Uh, for lunch, which is in the foyer, it's vegetarian and vegan. There are two um, moments for people to have uh, tours of the Lyric. Um, one is at 1.15 and one's at 1.45. And can you sign up for the afternoon breakout sessions at the registration desk? Um, I think that's all I need to say. Does everybody know what's happening in the afternoon? If you don't, um, come and ask us. Uh, and there are some great stands in the foyer from our partners. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.